Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of my problem solving series. Today, if you could tell by my shirt, we're going to be talking all about forces. So, for my algebra based people, don't worry about this derivative, which it looks like is flipped on my camera. But maybe force F equals MA be with you. So this was a Christmas gift this year because I'm a giant physics nerd, if we didn't know that already. So um, today's video, I'm going to break up into two parts. Um, I'm going to have the first part be focusing on the first law and the third law. So I think that those two kind of pair well together and go hand in hand and the third law could easily distill the first law. So that's why I want to talk about the two of them together. And then we'll talk about the second law separately. And I guess, so the shirt is the third law. Um, and the second law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. We'll talk about in the second part, because each of them also, those two kind of, in my mind, at least separate the types of problems that we can get. So the first law is just the law of inertia. I'm sure that all of you have heard throughout your lives. And that is that objects at rest stay at rest and objects in motion, and I'll kind of put an asterisk here that this is going to be constant motion, will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. And now the third law states that force equals mass times acceleration, or the other way that you'll commonly see it, and this is, again, the way I like to introduce the concept at least, um, and that's force divided by mass equals acceleration. And the reason why I like to do that is because connecting back to the first law, it's force that provides the acceleration and the amount of acceleration that you get is scaled by how massive the object is that you're trying to exert a force on. Um, so I just like to kind of write it that way. Typically it's much easier to write it as just F equals MA because it's a little bit easier to remember. But just to kind of keep in mind that acceleration is coming from force, not the other way around. So again, connecting that back to the first law, that means that if our acceleration is, if our force is zero, our acceleration is zero, which means that if you're sitting at rest, you have zero acceleration, you can't automatically like out of nowhere, just get a velocity. And if you're moving at a constant velocity, and again, there's no force, which means there's no acceleration. That means that your velocity isn't going to change and you're just going to keep going on whatever path you're going. First, go over some of the common forces and their definitions. So I'm just going to overlay transparently the common forces and their definitions. And I'm just going to read off my iPad and quickly go through them. So first up is going to be the gravitational force. Now I will say and put a little asterisk on this one. Um, you are later on most likely going to be learning a different gravitational force. So when you're dealing with very, very large objects like planets, um, which will change a little bit of the definition, but for the time being, and when you're thinking about local gravity, so gravitational forces happening relatively close to the surface of big planets, like we are on earth. Um, this is the situation that I'm talking about. So mass is going to be equal to acceleration due to gravity. So that will be usually just mg, where g is our 9.81 meters per second, the magnitude of it is. Um, this could be different, and you could be faced with a situation where you might be on, like, some planet A, and this is what your weight is or what your gravitational force is on this planet, and then you might have to solve for what the acceleration due to gravity is on that new planet, so that could be something, but typically we just think about that as our 9.81 meters per second squared, and that's always gonna point along the negative x-axis, so that should always be pointing straight down. The normal force is typically what I like to think of as the surface force, so it's basically just gonna be keeping any object that's touching a surface from falling through that surface. So if we were thinking about something, I have my coffee cup sitting in front of me, but you think about my hand pressing on my other hand, or just kidding, I will use this. So if you think about my mug pressing on my hand, gravity is keeping it down, 
but the forces from my hand, that normal force, keeps it from just falling right through my hand, right through the ground. So we need to have something there. That will always, well, so when you're on a horizontal surface, that points straight up. Um, but the caveat here and what you really need should be thinking about with normal force, and we'll see this because I'm going to do a solo video on inclined planes. Um, but normal force always points perpendicular away from the surface that the object is touching. Then we have frictional force, which will always be the coefficient of friction times the normal force. There's two different types of frictional forces and two different types of then coefficients of friction, and that's going to be static versus kinetic. So in the static case, it's when you have something, an object sitting at rest and you're trying to get it start moving, that would be the frictional force that's opposing that motion. It's typically a little bit bigger than the kinetic force, kinetic frictional force, which is the frictional force you feel while you're already in motion. Um, it's always going to point in the opposite direction of motion, so it should be pointing in the opposite direction of velocity. The oh, And there's no equation for coefficient of friction, so that would be something that would have to be given to you unless you're asked to solve for it. Obviously, you could always be asked for solve for these things, but the coefficient of friction is something that's going to depend on which two materials are rubbing against each other. So that would be something that would have to be provided to you. You wouldn't be expected to like memorize coefficients of frictions for things. Same idea with spring force. So this is always one that gets put in weird spots depending on the class you're in, but I think that it belongs here. So I'll talk about it here. And if you end up talking about spring somewhere else in your class, just come on back and watch it. But so spring force is always is the spring constant times the change in length of the spring. So the, again, the spring constant is going to depend on the properties of the spring of the spring itself. There's no equation for k unless you were given spring force and the change in length, and then you were asked to solve for k using this force equation. But otherwise, it would have to be provided for you or in a lookup table or something. And the spring force is always going to point in the opposite direction of the change in length. Pause, take a screenshot if you need to, um, and then use them as we go through the next step. Okay, so now that we have gone through the first and third law, hopefully you got to watch through my vectors video. If not, you'll get a little bit of a review on vector addition here. And... Yeah, let's go through this problem. So we want to find the normal force on a box of mass one kilogram that's being pulled by a force of 10 newtons at 30 degrees above the negative x axis. So in addition to guess method, which is always a good place to start, I'm now going to interject with that the importance of drawing a picture. So we do have that the mass of our object is one kilogram. We have some force external that we don't, and honestly, other than that, I want to draw a picture before I do anything. So I did say it was a box. Typically, you can even simplify objects further. I can't draw for shit. Can I say shit? Oh, God. Kids don't watch this video. <laughs> Typically, you can consolidate objects to just their center of mass point of where the forces are going to originate. For now, again, as we get to other things, that will change. But for the time being, that's what we want to think about. And I'll draw my forces in navy blue. But we have mg or fg. I guess I'll write it as, I'll do this. So force gravity is typically written as f little g. And like what I had on the previous page, that'll just be equal to mg there. Our surface is flat, so I will draw normal force pointing upwards. I don't know how you guys, normal force can be written a couple of different ways. I'm gonna write it as Fn instead of just capital N since the unit for forces is Newtons. So that's what we're solving for. So I'll also put a little question mark there. And then if I draw just a dashed line for our negative x axis, our last force is going to be 10 newtons, I'll just call it F, 
and this is 30 degrees. So we've got, I'll add those guys over here. So we've got FG equals MG, which is something that you could solve for since we have M and we know G is just always a constant, but I'm going to leave that. Eh, why not? And I'm going to use the approximation that G is about 10 just to make my life easy. So since this is one kilogram times 10, this will be 10 newtons. Hey, and this guy's going to be 10 newtons. Okay, so let's go back and think about our equations. The other thing I should have asked that I didn't put on here is what is A? So I'm just going to put on here, what is the acceleration? So that'll be part B, and I'll put that over here. So when we look at our equation for Newton's third law, that F equals MA, and remember our forces and our accelerations are vectors, which is going to come into play here, is the fact that this equation could be applied to either a single force to get the acceleration due to that force. So we'll take a simple example. If I just wanted to know the acceleration solely due to the gravitational force, I would just take Fg equals m times g, and I divide out the m, and hey, what do you know? The acceleration due to gravity is g. But we can also, and what's typically more likely what you want to do, is you're going to say that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration, since typically we have all of these forces counteracting each other, and the net force is going to ultimately tell us how this object is moving at the end of the day. Now, because these guys are vectors, net, so getting a net force would also be the same as taking the sum of all the forces, but as we know from vector addition, we have to do that in x and y. So I'm going to write this, so this would be the same as total, and then in case you guys haven't seen this notation before, this is going to be, well first let me write, so f net x equals m times ax, and f net y equals m times a y. And we can also write f net, I'll just write the x one, as that that's going to be the sum of, so this big sigma means the sum over all forces. So this would be like f1x plus f2x plus however many forces you have in there, and same for the y. So that's what we're going to want to do here. We're going to want to use this F net equation. I'll leave that on the screen for now, just so I can have it there. And if I need to erase it, we can. Which means that the first step that we need to do to solve this problem is to break down that 10 Newton force external, that's 30 degrees above the horizontal, and get its components. So I'm going to draw that in light blue. This is going to be, I'm just going to call it Fy and Fx, since we don't have any other forces here that we need to. What am I doing? That's so big, much bigger than it needs to be. And Fx, and using our Sokotoa rules, we can say that Fx over F is going to be equal to cosine 30. So that means that Fx will be equal to 10 cosine 30. I don't have my calculator on hand, so I'm just going to leave that like that for now. Fy over F is going to be sine 30, which means that Fy will be 10 cosine 30. So like I said, I'm just going to leave those. We don't need a final number, really. Once we have that, now let's just think about accelerations before we set up these equations. I'll write them out first. So we're going to have the sum of the forces in y equals m times a y. 
But it's not like we have this thing being pulled off the table. It's not falling through the table. So there should be no acceleration in the y. So this should actually be set equal to zero. Then we can say, so we have a positive normal force. One thing I'll say, this is kind of problem solver's choice, but I don't like to include the signs as much as I can on the forces. I'd rather just have the magnitudes and then include the signs later based on the picture that I drew. Uh, it's usually a lot easier. You're less likely to make conceptual mistakes based on the math just to bridge that gap. So just so you know, that's what I'm doing here. So that's going to come into play when we're adding. So we have a plus normal force, a plus force y, a minus fg, and that's going to be equal to zero. So from here, we can substitute in the values that we have. So we have fy, we found that was 10. Oh my god, I wrote cosine when that was supposed to be a sine. That should be sine, and this should be sine. 10 sine 30 minus 10, so that was what we found already for fg, equals 0. And then, so sine of 30, I do know that's a half, so this is just going to be 5 plus 5 plus or minus 10 is going to be negative 5. So we'll end up with fn minus 5 equals 0, and if you rearrange that, uh, okay, I'll go up here fn minus 5 equals 0. We'll add over our 5, so we'll get that normal force equals 5, and then the unit on that is newtons. So that would be our first guy. And again, so we're using a little bit of third law, a lot of vector addition. And then for the second part, so to find the acceleration, since we know that there's no acceleration in y, that means our acceleration is going to be all in x. So then the other equation we want to set up is the sum of the forces in x equals mAx. We only have one force. It's going to be negative 10 cosine 30 equals 1 times Ax. So we would divide out that Ax and whatever 10 cosine 30 would be our acceleration. And like I said, I'm just going to leave that meters per second squared. The negative sign ends up coming out the way that we wanted to and matches the direction that we have in the picture. Okay, so that's pretty much the basic example of problem solving using mostly third law. So again, third law generalizes into first law um, if you simplify by just setting a equal to zero, which actually we did because we had the normal, the y forces ended up summing to zero. But pretty much the structure of these and how you want to go about solving them is going to be, of course, to write out the givens that you have. Maybe, I would maybe even say draw the picture first. So maybe draw the force diagram first, then list the givens that you have on the side, and then from the picture, any vectors that aren't going strictly along the axes that you want. So again, in this video, we're basically just talking about x and y but we will come to some different axes a little bit later in the class, which I'll talk about when we get there. So you wanna break up the forces into those perpendicular axes, X and Y, sum the forces along those axes, set them equal to the mass times acceleration on that axis, and then solve for whatever they're asking for. That's generally how these types of problems are gonna go. Now the second type of force problem that you could also run into using Newton's second law is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. These, I feel like can get a little confusing, so let's jump into an example and I will talk you through what you're likely to see. Uh, is two boxes are connected by a string and then pulled to the right with a force. What is the acceleration of the boxes? What is the tension in the string connecting the two boxes? And I quickly wanna mention um, just because it wasn't on my list of common forces and it probably should have been is that tension is going to be the force found in strings. Anytime you have something connected by a string, you're always going to have tension pointing along the string as it's connected to that object. 
with that being said, also before we get into problem solving here, I want to make a note about systems versus environment. So we talk about already in the very first Newton's law that the things are going to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. But in order to know whether or not you have an outside force, you need to define your system and you need to define your environment. So when it comes to a situation like this, especially since the first question is what is the acceleration of the boxes? And I'm going to call these guys 1 and 2 for when we organize our information later. Because they are connected, they have to have the same acceleration. And then, so if you think about, yeah, I'll draw our forces on here too, real quick. So we've got FG1, FN1, FG2, and FN2. The first box is going to have tension pulling this way. But it's the same tension since it's the same string, so I'm also going to have in the other direction for box two, it's going to be pointing in the other direction. So we can absolutely take each of these boxes to be their own system, which is true in, in you know a lot of ways. So if we were to set up the sum of our forces, and again, so the A is going to be this way for both of them, if we were to set up our equations, so for one, sum of the forces, and the x is just going to be equal to ft equals ma. The sum of the forces and the y is going to be f n1 minus fg1 equals ma, well, equals zero. Not flying off the floor. And for two, the sum of our x forces is going to be F minus Ft equals Ma. I'm assuming that they have the same masses, but I guess they don't, so let me relabel these M1 and M2. And the sum of our Fy forces is going to be the second box is normal force minus the second box is gravitational force, and that's going to be equal to zero. So assuming that what we have given is our masses and our force, so let's assume we have m1, m2, and f. We're solving for a and ft. Then, I mean, we have two equations from our x equations for 1 and 2, and we have two unknowns, so we could totally go ahead and use substitution in both of these equations, and we could solve for a. However, before you go that route, which is just a little bit more work, the other thing I want you to consider, I'll put this in light blue, and I will also erase some of these dashed lines is that because they are having the same acceleration, from the perspective of this external force, it has no idea that there are two boxes here. It just knows what the total mass is, and it knows that because of the total mass that's there, it's only providing a certain amount of acceleration. So if you include both boxes as the system and then just all the other forces as what's external, I mean, except for, so now this would disclude the tension forces because they're internal to the system since they're between the two boxes. But if we look at our forces in the X, that only force is going to be that external force F equals MA, but now our mass is going to be the total mass of the system. So then you have just one equation that you can simply solve for A. And then once you have A, you could plug that in to, again, these first two, these FX equations for both objects, and from there, you could solve for T. So this is very common. You'll often have, like, multiple boxes, something like this. One that's a little bit more complicated that I did want to mention is 
there's also these situations where you'll have two boxes sitting on top of each other. So let's say we have a square and a rectangle and that this guy is being pulled by some external force. Again, it's usually helpful to draw both of their force diagrams separately. So I'll draw this guy over here and this guy down here. I'll call them one and two again. So for one, we still have gravitational force one. We have normal force one. But because the box wants to stay still, um, but the bottom box is pulling forward, if there's frictional forces between these two surfaces, so I'll draw it a little rough to indicate that there's friction there, the friction on the top box is going to be pointing, I guess I won't indicate static or kinetic because I didn't make up a full problem for this, but the frictional force, which we usually call lowercase f, would be pointing to the right for the first box, since the first box is trying to stay put and the frictional force wants to oppose that motion. Whereas for the bottom box, it's going to have FG2, FN2. We'll assume that there's no friction between whatever surface it's sitting on. It's going to have that force, external force F, capital F, pulling it to the right. And then because the frictional or the external force is pulling it to the right, the frictional force on the second box felt by the first box is going to be pointing to the left. And then I just want to highlight these in, ooh, actually, I can exactly highlight them. Why haven't I been doing this the whole time? So I'm going to highlight the fact that the frictional force is going to be that interacting force or our Newton's, that's where Newton's second law is coming in. And these guys should be equal to each other. So even though they're opposite in direction, as the law states, they're equal in magnitude. I didn't draw them that way because um, I never draw anything to scale. But they should be equal and opposite as second law states. And we'll go back to me in person to wrap up and give my final thoughts on forces. Is it snowing? Are you so excited? Are you so excited for the snow? How old's her? <gasps> <laughs> Say bye to the kiddos!